Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the journey. We're so glad that you're here today. Welcome to our church. If it's your first time here, uh, a special welcome to you. So glad that you're here with us and the building, or if you're watching online, or if you're at our Highlands Ranch location. In fact, can you guys help me welcome our Highlands Ranch location? Thanks for being here today. Uh, if you'd like a little bit more information about our church, there's a little connect card on the note-taking outline that you received when you came in. It's at the bottom, and I just want to encourage you to fill out as much as you're comfortable with. Uh, at the end of the service today, someone will pass an offering bucket up and down the aisle, and you can simply drop it in there. I always give people the hassle-free guarantee. No one's going to uh, call you or come to your house. We'll simply send you an email with some next steps that you can take, a little bit more information about our church. We have something called Crash Course happens uh, next Sunday. It's always the first step to getting involved here at Journey. I want to encourage you to go and check that out on the website. Uh, this weekend, we've got marriage conference coming up here at Journey. It's off-site. It's at a hotel in the tech center. Uh, it's a Friday evening, Saturday morning up until lunch. Have uh, hundreds of people signed up, and we have a few more spaces left. If you would like to jump in on that, there's still time. Uh, we always have a great time together, great food, uh, great teaching. We've got a guest speaker and his wife coming in uh, from out of town. They wrote a book on marriage. Very, very practical and helpful. Love for you to be there. And then this doesn't really affect our 8 o'clock crew, but we have a new uh, service here at the Castle Pines location, uh, our new service time. We're moving it up uh, from 11 to 11.15. Uh, we've only had six or eight fights in the parking lot between 9.30 uh, and 11, so we're giving a little bit more space and time for people to get in and out. Uh, how many know there's a good problem when you have so many people trying to get in and out of church? So that's a good problem to have. We're building just as fast as we can. That's going really, really well, but we decided to push it back 15 minutes. So thank you for being here today. And for the eight o'clock crowd, I mean, these are people who really love Jesus. I mean, it's not even 10 degrees. It's early and you're here. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're culminating 21 days of prayer and fasting today. Uh, if you're brand new to our church at the beginning of every year, we set aside three weeks to intentionally seek God. And I know a lot of you uh, have experienced some some real breakthrough in your life because I keep hearing stories of, hey, I was reading through the devotionals uh, that we sent out through emails. And weren't, weren't those amazing? Just people in our church who wrote them and uh, everything from middle schoolers all the way up to senior adults and people in different positions in life and just writing those. It was just a powerful time. So we end that today and just turn our attention toward what does God want to do this year in your life and in my life and in our church. And I was with uh, one of my great friends last night and he was breaking his fast. He was, had not had solid food for 21 days. And so we had, had a little party last night at a restaurant. And I don't know how he felt later after that cheese dip, but uh, it was a special moment for us. So let me pray. We'll jump into the message God, we're just so grateful to be here today. Uh, I know that here in the room or watching online, uh, there at the Highlands Ranch location, that there are people from all different walks of life and backgrounds and perspectives. And uh, some of them, they come to church every week. Some of them are giving it a try. They're looking for a new church. Some of them, a friend invited them today, and they're not even really sure what they believe about the Bible or where they are with you. But I, I just pray, no matter where we are, that you'll just meet us right there, speak to us, encourage us, help us to take steps closer to you. Give us the words we need today, encouragement or hope or uh, direction or correction in our lives. Just help us today. And if you're open to hearing from God, I just invite you to say this simple prayer that we pray every time we gather together as a church. If you're new, just a simple prayer between you and God, just quietly between you and him, something like this. God, would you please speak to me today? Because I'm listening. And then um, pray for somebody else, somebody that you're seated beside, maybe you came to church with today, maybe you don't even know them, maybe they're a stranger. Just a simple prayer for them, something like this. God, would you talk to this person today? Would you give them what they need? And would you give them the faith and the courage to respond to you? In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Why don't you turn to somebody and tell them who you think is going to win one of the games today. And if you don't know what games are playing, there are two NFL games playing, and you're like, I don't care. I don't care. All right. So 
We're in the middle of this teaching series uh, called The Way. I'll tell you more about that in, in just a moment. Uh, in the early uh, 1900s, there was a tightrope walker, and his name was Blondin. Um, and so he was the first guy to walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And so evidently, the huge crowds would gather and watch him do this. Um, and they, they didn't have a lot going on. They didn't have football going on. So they, they went to see tightrope walking. And so big crowd there. And they, he walks across the tightrope to one side of Niagara Falls. Uh, and there's a big crowd waiting there for him. And people were cheering and just going crazy. They had just watched an unbelievable feat. And then he, he starts to say, do you believe in me? And they're like, yeah, we believe, we believe. And he has this act where he he puts someone in a wheelbarrow and walks them back across the tightrope. And he's going to do that on Niagara Falls. And he says, do you believe that I can put somebody in this wheelbarrow and walk them back to the other side? And they're like, yes, we can't wait to see that. We believe, we believe. I mean, the whole crowd is just chanting. And then he says, well, which one will it be? Like he's waiting on a volunteer. I mean, crickets, right? You know? <laughs> no. Until one guy raises his hand and says, I'll do it. Probably had a lot of beers that day and said, I'll do it. And gets in the wheelbarrow and they make their way back across the other side. Now, why don't I tell you that story? Because a huge crowd of people were shouting, we believe, we believe, we believe. But only one person really believed. Right? Right? And in church, especially in spiritual world, we, we love to say, we believe, we believe, we believe, but really our belief is proved by our actions. Like what we say we believe is only really true when it gets fleshed out in our lives. And that's what this teaching series has been about, the way of Jesus. I want you to look at our theme verse with me together. If you're taking notes, write a few things down today. Matthew 4. 19 and 20, Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, come follow me, not believe in me, not study me, come follow me. Like, and what we've said is that he's inviting people to be disciples, learners, which means we're going to be with Jesus. We're going to become like Jesus. We're going to do what Jesus did. And it says that they leave things behind and then they change their lifestyles and they go and they follow Jesus. Not just grabbing hold to a set of beliefs, but practicing a way of living. They become like Jesus. In fact, one of the disciples that Jesus says this to a little bit later, John, in 1 John, he says, whoever claims to live in him, in Jesus, must, come on, say it with me, live as Jesus did. He says, listen, if we're going to claim that we are Christians or followers of Jesus, we must actually follow Jesus. Our lives should look like his life. Now, none of us are perfect and none of us are the son of God, but the way that we live our life, the way that we see the world, it matters. In fact, Jesus would say the difference is in the doing. That knowing about the lifestyle of Jesus and living the lifestyle of Jesus are two different things. And he invites us to that. In fact, the name for Christianity in the early church was called the way, the people of the way. Hey, they have some crazy beliefs, but they live a certain way. They look like, act like Jesus. So for several weeks here at Journey in this series of talks, we've been talking about habits. I've been on an eight-week discipleship journey around the habits of Jesus. That if we want to be followers of Jesus, adopting the things that Jesus did oftentimes will lead us to the kind of person that Jesus was. And we've talked about prayer, we've talked about fasting, we've talked about community. Today we're going to talk about one big habit of Jesus, and that is the habit of worship. The habit of worship. And what does that look like? in a very practical way in your life and in my life. So I want to look at this verse together. This is Luke 4, 16. It says that Jesus, he and his disciples, went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. This is hometown for him. And on the Sabbath, which for them was Friday evening into Saturday, uh, on that day they went into the synagogue, their gathering of God's people, as was, say these two words with me, as was his custom. Now, what is that? It's a habit. 
It's a regular behavior. And then Jesus began to stand up and read there in the synagogue. So what we find out is that Jesus had this regular habit and custom of gathering with other believers, gathering with God's people to pray, to sing, to lift his hands, to lift his eyes, to refocus, to hear the teaching of God's word. It was a part of his custom and his routine and his rhythm of life because it's so incredibly important. And underneath all that, we're going to call that today worship. Now, if you're taking notes with me today, this is really, really important, okay? Everyone worships. Everyone. And you may be saying to yourself, well, not me. Like, I'm not one of those people. Like, I, maybe you're in the category of, I don't even know where I stand with God, or maybe you're like, I, I'm, I've been an atheist in my life, or I've been, everyone worships. Maybe you're like, hey, I'm a church person, and sometimes I go, but I'm not one of those people. Like, I come to church, and there's some singing going on, and there's some people who are excited, there's some people who got, they're getting it. They're doing this right here. They got hands up. They're doing the whole thing. And they're like, you know, field goal for Jesus. I mean, they're getting it. And that's not me. Like I'm, I'm a reserved person. Like I might do this right here, or I might get the wings flapping if I get real excited. Like, <laughs> listen, this is, this is, you, you have to get this. This is where we're going today. Wor- worship is way more than singing. It, it, it is singing. In fact, there's all these postures of worship in the Bible. There's bowing, there's kneeling, there's hands being lifted, there's shouting, there's speaking, they're standing quietly in reverence. There's all different postures of worship, but it's, it's way more than singing. Why? Because everyone worships. It's a human quality, and it doesn't really even matter what you're what your religious beliefs are. It is hardwired into every man and woman to be a worshiper. That's what we do. Why? Because worship equals value. What, what we value. The word worship comes from an English, old English word that has to do with worthiness. In fact, the original like speaking of the word was worthship. What, what I consider worthy of my energy and my time and my passion. Um, I love this quote from Louis Giglio, which had a huge impact on my life. He was, he's a pastor in Atlanta, and I sat in Bible studies that he did for college students and is still doing for college students, and he leads a church there, and he speaks a lot about worship, and this impacted me so greatly as a college student. He says, you simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, your allegiance, and at the end of that trail, come on, You find a throne. Everybody has one. Look at what it says. And whatever or whoever is on that throne is what is what is highest value to you. And on that throne is what you worship. Everybody is a worshiper. And that could be your family, uh, which is a good thing, but could be the highest priority in your life. Could be your spouse, could be an accomplishment or your education or, or, or it could be the things that you accumulate or your, your job or your home or your cars or your fashion or a sports team. Like it, it could be a lot of things, but everyone worships. Why? Because everyone prioritizes their life around what they think is most important, what they value the most. And then we give it Worship. We give it our time, our energy, our passion, our sacrifice. So we worship those, those things. Have you ever had an event that was just crazy in your life? Uh, like going, maybe you took your family on a trip. Maybe you took your little kids to Disney World. And you're like, this is amazing. This is so good. We spent $17,000 <laughs> to stand in long lines with sweaty people from all over the world, with crying babies and strollers with wheels falling off. It was so great. And you, just, and you just describe it to someone and they're like, really? Was it worth it? And you're like, oh yeah, it was amazing. 
uh, growing, my kids growing up, they were involved in all kinds of sports. How many of you are sports fans? Like you're, you're right now in it or your kids were in sports and you just did the travel sports thing and you were at games all day long or some swim meets, which by the way, they're going to have swim meets in hell. Uh, just, <laughs> it's hot. It goes forever. You don't know when it's going to end. Does that sound familiar? Okay. So anyway, and, and, And if you're living in that moment or have lived through that moment as a parent, you're driving your kids from there to here to there and it's an Uber thing and you're sitting all day long, you're paying extravagant amounts of money and people will look in from the outside and go, really? Was it worth it? And you go, yeah. Like some of my best memories, Mike, we grew up as a family doing those things, the conversations that we had and people might look in and go, that's kind of crazy, but for you, it was worth it. Listen, What the Bible, what Jesus is calling us to do is to orient our lives, what we what we have allegiance toward, what we sacrifice for, how we prioritize our life around the things that matter most in in life. Now this is this is important, this is really good. Is that worship is a response. Worship is a response. When we think about worship in the terms of what it looks like to worship God, worship is a response for who God is and what he has done. A response to how he is interacting in our lives, what he is doing for us, but also for his character. And worship is a response to what's happening, something that's wonderful or awesome or big or unbelievable. And, and listen, before you think, well, you know, I'm just not that kind of person. I don't know if I ever really respond like that. I've just been in so many environments where people respond when something amazing is going on and they just can't help it. Like how many of you have been to a concert recently? This is not, by the way, a picture of a Christian concert. This is just a, a normal concert. Here's a whole bunch of girls. I don't know, even know where, who they're singing to or about, but this is not your local worship concert. They just got hands up. They're singing, eyes closed. Maybe I'll meet a dude here. And then if you're like, oh, that's a lot of girls. Hey, guys, too. Here we go. This guy right here. This is an Ed Sharon concert. People are getting fired up about Ed Sharon, redheaded guy from somewhere in Europe. And so, but hey, maybe you're like, I'm not a big concert guy. Maybe you're a sports person, right? Like just going nuts. Hey, let's, let's get dressed up. How about this? Best college team in America two years in a row. <laughs> Paint your body. People getting excited. Now, listen, I want to just, this is a picture, a captured moment, okay? Um, and if, if you don't know, I'll just let me just set you up. Let me help you out. So the Georgia Bulldogs are playing the Ohio State Buckeyes, and Ohio State has dominated this entire game, and we think we're going to lose. And at the very stroke of midnight, at the end of the game, See, the Georgia Bulldogs are dominant, and they hang on, and they just keep coming, and they end up being just a point ahead. And then, but as time is running out, the Ohio State kicker misses a kick at the stroke of midnight, and Georgia wins. Now listen, this is that moment. Oh, hold on. I know I'm, I'm cue them. With them. <laughs> if you haven't figured that out, you're coming here. Uh, anyway, this is this moment. No one came over the loudspeaker and said, right now you should cheer. No one said, laugh, cry, jump up and down, lift your hands. No one, it was not necessary to describe a response. They just responded. So listen, this is, you got to get this today. Followers of Jesus worshiping. Radical grace always results in extravagant worship. You have to hear me today. If you have teeny tiny worship, you have a teeny tiny God. If we're not worshiping appropriately, it is because we have lost sight of the greatness, the bigness, the goodness, the mercy, the unbelievable condition I was in when God found me. There's a story in the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 6 where it says this man, Isaiah, walks into the temple and he has been in a 
in political power for a long time. He is an elite person. He is wealthy and strong, powerful. And he comes into the temple and it just simply says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I came into the temple and I saw the Lord. And he was high and lifted up and he was exalted. And there were these angels and they were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And he says, I saw this, him high and lifted up and smoke filled the temple. And I saw God and it says, then I saw me. I looked at my, I'm like, I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a person who is in desperate need. And then he uses this word, woe to me. In other words, let the mountains fall on top of me. I, I am an unworthy person in the presence of God. And it says, as he falls down, God sends this angel to him and he takes a, an, a burning coal from the altar with tongs and he comes and he touches his lips and he says, I have healed you. I have atoned for your sin. I have forgiven you. He gives him mercy in that moment. And then God says, who will go for us? Who will sacrifice and carry our message to the world? And he stands up and he goes, I don't know what that involves, but I will. He worships in that moment because he has seen God for who he is. He's seen himself for who he really is. And then he has experienced the mercy of God. That is the gospel. That is what we teach here every week. And if I have little bitty worship and man, I'll get to God when I get, get a chance. Or if I don't have anything better going on. We, ha we have lost sight of this idea that radical grace always results in extravagant worship. Why? Because worship is personal. Have you ever been to a sporting event and you stand and you sing the national anthem and some people are talking and watching and doing this and, you know, watermelon, watermelon, you know, just singing along. And then, then you look over and you see someone standing at attention, maybe tears streaming down. Because that's not a song that we sing before a basketball game or a football game. They have seen and experienced sacrifice. They know what the song means. They know what it means to to put everything, blood and treasure on the line for this freedom. And so they, come on, they experience that moment in a different way. Why? Because they, they have seen what it cost. Sometimes when you're in church and you see someone and they are worshiping, and they're happy or they just quietly stand before God. I'm not a big extru exorbitant guy. Like, I, like when we sing or worship, I don't get it. You know, I, that's not me. Like, I'm a pretty reserved guy. Even, like, I coached football for years for my kids, and when something would happen, great, i go, Ugh. like, that's it. That's the highest you're going to get from me. But in the moment when you see somebody and you go, man, that person seems really moved, it's because they know how much they have been forgiven. Come on. They know how, they know how far God has brought them. When they read a line on a song and we sing it and they have experienced it, it, it tastes different coming out of their mouth. Two years ago, I was just broken and tired and overwhelmed and like, I just don't know what to do, God. Some of you were around for that. Some of you are brand new. I took some time off, but I, I just felt lost. And there's a few songs that we sing now. And I think about the redemption of God in my life over the last two years, the blessings and the faithfulness and the character of God. And come on, it's personal. But this is so important, and this is where we're going to land today, because this is where we, we intersect with the habit of Jesus. And that is that worship is also corporate. All throughout the Bible, from the beginning pages to the end, for the last 2,000 years of the church, it, it would be so foreign to followers of Jesus to only worship on their own. Worship is corporate. It's about the body. It's about the people of God gathering together and experiencing something. 
refocusing our lives and, and turning our attention into God and having the habit and the discipline of doing that. We went through a phase in the life of the church where we would say things in well-meaning ways like, hey, don't go to church, be the church. Except that I've just found it's really hard to be the church if you don't go to church. There's something about gathering together on a regular rhythm weekly with the people of God where we lift our eyes off of everything that else is going on. Take our eyes off of screens and put our eyes on the King of Kings. Something changes in us when we do that to, together. In fact, it's a simple verse, but many of you know it. Matthew 18, it says, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So in your small group, that happens. But there's something about coming together corporately as a church and worshiping God. Some, it, there's something different about it. Listen to me. There's something different about gathering together regularly as a discipline for your life personally. Now I'm preaching to the crowd, right? Who are, yeah, you're right, I'm here. But I just want to continue to remind us that. Did you know that as early as 20 years ago, the average church member committed to their church, attended their church 2.3 times a month. Uh, now uh, it's significantly less than that. It's like 0.7, like a really committed person in a church will attend possibly one time a month. So anywhere from eight to nine, 10 times a year. And that's like, I'm all in. This is my church because we have so many other options. And so I wanna, I wanna encourage us on the way of Jesus. And then let me just give you a couple of pro tips from the guy who is at church a lot, okay? Listen, decide ahead of time. Decide ahead of time. This is part of my life. You go to church. I gather together with other believers. Decide ahead of time. Uh, for, for me and my family, um, it's, it's not a Saturday night decision. It's not a Sunday morning decision. Like we, We're going to be involved. Now you're like, well, of course you are. You get paid to be here. But there's a lot of my life that I wasn't. That we just decide ahead of time. How about this? This is important. I think prepare before. Hey, I'm... Listen, this is really old school. I'm doing, I'm doing some old school talking to you this morning. But we, we, we're coming not to a movie, not to a concert, not to a performance. We're coming together as the people of God into the house of God. Now, I know theologically God is everywhere, and, but there's something about coming and being ready and getting here early and finding a seat and preparing myself and not being rushed. There's, there's something about, I've, I've come to meet with God today. Sometimes we think about church as a spectator event, and then we'll go home and go, I don't really like that song today. Like, I mean, we had a guest speaker, and remember that, and with Scotty, he just wasn't on, and, you know, and we didn't play my favorite song, and then I normally park right here, and somebody was there, and then I got in here, and somebody else was in my seat, and come on, guy. I mean, yeah, we've all done it, like, but it's not a... It's not a spectator, but it's a participation sport. We come ready. How about this? This is just old school. Bring a Bible. I know that we put the Bible verses on the screen. We do that because we want to help everybody see what we're talking about. But there's something about holding a physical Bible. Like, this is so crazy. When I went to church, when, when I was becoming a Christian in, in the 90s, we didn't have screens. We would just come in with our lanterns. Like, it was before electricity. <laughs> and, no, I'm just kidding. But there, there was something about when the pastor talked about a certain verse, like opening the Bible and finding that. And then, oh, you know, I don't want to remember that and like circling it or underlining it. And that's why we give you the outlines to take home with you, because I think there's something about finding your way around that. How about this? Engage and be open. Listen, this is, I've been in a lot of church services and some of them have been amazing. Like, oh, this is like heaven. I think heaven will be like this. I've been some of them like <laughs> one, like purgatory maybe. Like this is not good. But here, here's what I decided. Just when I gather with other believers, God is there and I'm going to come and I'm going to have a white belt mentality. Like I'm going to be, have an open pot. God has something to say to me today. Whatever the person on the stage says, like God can take what they're saying and say what, what I need. 
In fact, almost every week, someone will come to me and go, hey, that just really spoke to me. And they'll say, when you said this, and I'm thinking, I know I didn't say that. I don't even know if I believe that. Um, but if that's what, that's what you needed today, so glad God gave it to you. And so how about this? Join a serve team. So many people, hundreds of people in our church go, this is my church. And, and I, I come to church and I worship and I listen and I, and, and I get what I need, but then I go and I serve somebody else. I help park cars or, or I, I help with third graders. In fact, I've, I've, I've been told like, hey, we, we've got lots of people holding babies, but we've got like 97 third graders. So could you tell people we don't need somebody to hold babies. We need somebody to hold down third graders. So <laughs> anyway, there's something about that. And then listen, this, this is again, pro level tip. Invite someone. Church is different when you're sitting beside somebody you've invited. You go, oh man, I'm so, it's just, you're doing it together. And then, again, I told you I was going a little old school today, but I feel like there's just a couple of things that I want to say to our church around this idea. Because when I say this, hey, we should all go to church regularly, sometimes that seems like a foreign concept to people recently. And so I want to just say a couple of things. I wrote them down so I I would say them correctly. Um, One, parents. If you're a parent in this room, we model. Not by what we say, but by what we do. Now, this is not a guarantee. This is not a guarantee. But oftentimes... Parents will say to me, I've been doing this a long time. I was a youth pastor for a long time and then a senior pastor now. Hey, my kids went to college. They became adults and never found a church. And it's just not really important to them. This is a lot of conversations with parents whose kids have left the home. And in moments where they're honest, they'll say, it could be that we communicated to them by our actions that this wasn't really important to us because we didn't make church a priority for our family. I'm saying this not to make anybody feel guilty. I'm saying this to all of our young families to remind you that modeling is important. What if my kid is sick? Well, bring a bag, they can throw up at church. Like, you know, just, I'm just, I'm just kidding. We live in a culture, we are a very affluent culture, where we have a lot of choices. And many people, honestly, and I fall into this category sometimes myself, if nothing better comes up, I'll be there. It's just true. We have a lot of choices. And we think to ourselves, you know what? I don't want to commit to go to church because I don't want to be legalistic. You ever heard that term? I, don't, I just don't want to be legalistic. Well, don't worry. You're not even close. I thought that'd be funnier. <laughs> I'm just talking about the spiritual discipline of showing up. Like, hey, remember, worship is about what I prioritize, what's most important to me, and I reorient my life around it. This, is, this happens uh, so much uh, to us. And again, I don't, I don't want to be negative at all because I'm so grateful for it. But so many people watch online and it's a great option. I meet people every week who go, hey, I've been afraid to come to the building. I'm brand new to faith. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm watching. I'm trying to get up my courage. And I finally came today. I love that. People go, hey, I'm sick or I've got this going on or we're watching from the mountains. Okay, okay great. But if it's your only option, I'm just saying to you, you're missing out. Did you know that every single Sunday during our worship Sunday hours, 800 devices on average watch online? So we don't know if that's one or two people or three people or one. So at least 800 more adults, let's just say, because there's not a lot of four-year-olds dialing in to watch old Scotty on the YouTuber. And so, and that was old, (laughs) joking. So anyway... I just want to say to you, there's something about being in the room. There's something about the presence of God. And if you're here, you know that. So here's here's the last one. Hey, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And you know what I would just say to you about that? You're right. But it sure helps. 
It sure helps to gather with God's people on a regular basis and have this commitment. Attending church shows what we value. Showing up matters. It builds an identity. I'm a part of this group. I'm, a, I'm committed to this people. And, and I'm, I reorient my life around worshiping God. And I change my schedule in order to do that. Why? I'm just practicing the way of Jesus. Because on Sabbath, as was his custom, he attended synagogue. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. I want to say this to you as we close. Consistency beats intensity. Sometimes people get fired up. I'm going to church. And they'll go for a week or two and then ah, I just got out of the habit of going. Consistency, showing up week in and week out matters. There have been so many times where I have gone to the gym. I like to go to the gym. I might not look like I go to the gym, kind of goes up and down, but I like to go to the gym. And so many times I'll leave there and think, well, that was a waste of time. That wasn't too good. I didn't get a great workout today. But you know what? My body didn't really care because I moved it. I, I, I made a vote for the kind of person that I want to be. I, I have an identity as a person who likes to exercise. And, and consistency, come on, trumps intensity. So I just want to invite you into the way of Jesus to say, I want to be a person who worships. And worship is singing, and it is reading scripture, and it is kneeling and praying, and all those kinds of things. But really, it's about reorienting my life around what matters most. So I want to encourage you to make gathering with God's people to worship a habit in your life. So let's pray together. I realize as I'm leading us into prayer that for those of you who are here in the room or at Highlands Ranch, even watching online, you might have a consistent habit of doing that. I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir, right? I'm preaching to the people who... But maybe today you're just here and you go, hey, yeah, we're, we're, I'm one of those persons or we're one of those people that we just we, we kind of come when we can. But maybe you would just say quietly to God, I know how important this is. And I just want to recommit myself to practicing the priority of worship in my life. Maybe you would say today, what I need more than anything in the world is I need a relationship with God. I need to start following Jesus. And if that's you, uh, I just want you to take a moment and just say a quiet, simple prayer to God. I'm ready to get started. I'm ready to start following you. Maybe you just say quietly to God, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sin and rose from the grave. Maybe just say to him, the best way I know how, I want you to come into my life and help me to start following you today. Forgive me of all the things I've done wrong. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.